Good morning, everybody, if you're in the UK, that is. Um, welcome to this online roundtable. Welcome back after your summer break. I hope you're well, well rested. Uh, the Russia and Eurasia program is certainly back, uh, and we'll be trying to cope with the immediate and the long-term trends as think tanks ought to do, I suppose. Uh, when I say immediate, one or two things come to mind. Uh, perhaps right now, uh, it's the attempted murder of Alexei Navalny. Um, and in some ways, Kadia Solsky and I were just debating this. To me, it, it doesn't change much. It, it, makes, it does make the, the title of today, the reconfiguration of a regime, in some ways look a little odd, um, because I don't believe that the nature of a regime is changing particularly. Um, and so one has to ask, what's, what's, you know, in what, 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 what does change really mean? But the real experts, i.e. not me, uh, we do have three of them speaking today, would certainly tell you that I suppose the regime is like the proverbial paddling duck, that there's a lot going on under the water. And so that's what we're trying to get across to you today, what's going on under the surface. Um, <clears throat> so what, I, but what I've tried to instill in the speakers, I suppose, is to talk about meaningful change or significant change insofar as that there is any, um, as opposed to cosmetic change and, and rearranging the deck chairs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm sure the presenters have slightly altered their presentations uh, to acknowledge and to take account of yesterday's news. That makes sense. Like I say, and to my mind, it doesn't change as much Although to Arkady's mind is in particular and to, and to, and to uh, Nikolai's, it, it does. But uh, so this is going to be an interesting discussion, an interesting discussion. Let's go to the speakers. In batting order, first of all, we will hear from Arkady Ostrowski. He is, of course, the Russia editor for The Economist who is, I'm sure, responsible for this week's front cover story on what Putin fears. Um, he's also the author of The Invention of Russia um, about the rise of Putin and disinformation. Akadi will set the scene and take a little bit of a look at the political economy as well, but talk about yesterday's events too, as they are relevant to this topic of reconfiguration of a regime. Yekaterina Shulman is an associate fellow of the Russian Eurasia program here. Um, she's also associate professor at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences and a senior lecturer at the Russian Presidential Academy uh, of the National Economy and Public Administration. Um, she's also, according to a recent poll, one of the most influential people in Russia. Um, Yekaterina will speak about the legislative processes and the state Duma elections forthcoming. Last but not least, Kolya Petrov, Nikolai Petrov, is the Chatham House Senior Research Fellow covering domestic politics with particular foci on the decision-making processes uh, and on the regions. And he will talk to us about the changes in the regime again and how the latest events affect, latest events affect that and something a little bit more about central regional relations. So that's it, uh, 10 minutes per speaker today. That will give us just under an hour for discussion afterwards. And over to you, Arkady, please. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, if you're in London, um, it's, it's a great honor and it's sort of high toll order to speak before um, such a group of experts, uh, very influential in, in Britain and the West, and, and as we've heard in Russia. Um, uh, Obviously, the, the subject matter was set up uh, before uh, the extraordinary string of events uh, and before the news of Alexei Navalny being uh, poisoned with um, a nerve agent uh, of a Novichok group. Uh, and the fact that it stands um, the test of this few weeks, I think it's, it's, it's a testimony to, to the right question, that the regime in Russia is, uh, being, is, is in the process of reconfiguration. Uh, and I think to, to start with, I'd like to uh, reflect uh, just the degree and the scale to which we are uh, in a process, uh, in a movement, in a flux, in a historic moment. Um, as um, Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, for those of you who, who speak Russian, you know, famously said, process pashol you know, the process has, has begun. Uh, and it's begun literally with, with vengeance. Uh, in two countries which have, for the past 20 years, the two regimes which have very much based themselves in the idea of um, stability, a return to stability after a chaotic transition uh, of the 1990s. Uh, rest, two restorationist regimes uh, Lukashenko in Belarus started first, uh, a populist autocrat uh, who uh, promised to pledge to bring back the Soviet order. Putin started from a different point, all the more interesting that he arrived at a similar one uh, 20 years later, repeating many of 
uh, Lukashenko's tricks in, in staying in power. Both regimes are struggling uh, with the key uh, question of transition of power uh, and the lack of the uh, any uh, system or instruments in doing so. Um, and I do think that the, the, what, first of all, it tells us is that the stability, that period um, which was hailed by both uh, leaders uh, is definitely over. Uh, nothing that we observe in Belarus, nothing that we observe in Russia today uh, remotely uh, can be called uh, stability. And I think that is uh, worth keeping in mind for the understanding of why the two regimes have come to this sort of crunch point, uh, the point of transformation at the same time, that behind the events, the everyday events, there is a sort of a meta-narrative, there is a meta-history of the tiredness, exhaustion of that narrative of stability, post-revolutionary stability uh, of the 1990s. Uh, the second thing which is worth reflecting on is, and I know everybody is sick and tired, our readers um, in The Economist are sick and tired of um, me and others writing that how brittle this regime is, uh, this are, and Putin still in power, Lukashenko still in power, uh, Putin just extended his rule uh, pretty much indefinitely. Uh, yes, they are, but I think that all the events of the past week only bear evidence to the fact how brittle uh, these regimes are and how sudden the change is. Can I just remind everybody that, that only two months ago, uh, Alexander Lukashenko was standing in full military gear uh, in, on parade in Minsk, uh, completely confident that he will succeed in achieving what he's achieved uh, for the past uh, 20 years and will rig the elections just as successfully as he's done before and will award himself the same 80% he's done for the past four years in the elections. Um, opponents have been removed, media was under control, security apparatus was under control, everything was in check. Um, suddenly, you know, two months later, we are observing the scenes that, that we have been both inspiring and terrifying uh, on, this, on the streets uh, of Minsk. Uh, similarly, uh, Vladimir Putin was, uh, okay, the time scale is slightly different. Uh, we, should, we could probably, a thing back to 2018, uh, a triumphant victory in the um, in the presidential elections. Um, everything seems to be under control. Uh, suddenly, he has to grapple with the uh, with this transition coming up with this farcical uh, pseudo uh, pseudo sort of constitute you know constitutional re pseudo referendums, which amount to a constitutional coup, uh, and most importantly, uh, Alexei Navalny. Uh, a, a key element of not just Russian political system, but I would argue a key element of Vladimir Putin's own security and legitimacy is lying in a coma. So the moment has come. It is brittle. We are in flux. We don't know where it's going to end, um, but we are in the times of turbulence of which, you know, the parallel of which are very, very hard, you know, to, to think of certainly in the, in the history of the post-Soviet post Russia. And in fact, uh, I would argue that uh, in terms of the potential consequences, both for the integrity, um, and we'll probably not have time to speak about this, but in, both in, for the integrity of, Russian, of Russia as a country and staying in its territorial borders, the international conflicts um, and the uh, integrity of the European Union and its security, we're in more uncertain times than we were um, uh, possibly even in, uh, in including the uh, 8991. That's uh, a provocative statement, but I, I, we, we could discuss that. Uh, I will, uh, people are probably more familiar with the, with the events in, in Belarus. Um, what's gone wrong, we can discuss that. I think there was a combination of factors. There was a time, as I said, of this idea of stability. There was the economic stagnation that's been going on for five years. And then, of course, there was the black swan uh, in form of the COVID and the callous uh, response from Lukashenko, which destroyed his idea in the idea of paternalism, uh, the father of the nation, um, and a massive miscalculation in allowing uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, a housewife and a former school teacher, to stand in elections, giving the protest uh, a very strong female face, uh, a nonviolent protest, very much fitting into the tradition 
starting from Gandhi to uh, the Velvet Revolutions uh, of the 1990s, being joined by two other women. Uh, so, you know, combination of the long-term factors of economy, uh, political cycles, and the Black Swan, a perfect storm. The, um, just two words about Alexei Navalny um, uh, and what, what's happening there. Uh, on the one hand, it's very striking that there has been no uh, big response in Russia itself. We, and, and let's state that firmly now, uh, I don't think this will continue, but for now, there's been no mass protests in Russia. There's been no political fallout. Everything is sort of in this moment of freeze. Everybody is, is uh, forgive this pun, might not be appropriate, but everybody is sort of camatosed. Uh, and waiting uh, to see how the events develop. Partly it's because Alexei Navalny is in a coma. We don't know uh, what condition he will come out, for how long he will be incapacitated. But the poisoning, the fact that it has been clearly um, uh, committed by agencies affiliated with the state on the orders of the Kremlin or with the, or with the knowledge of the, of the Kremlin is a very significant development. Um, Alexei Navalny was um, removed not as some uh, Western media has described as just a critic or a thorn in the eye of the Kremlin. He uh, was the politician number two in Russia. Russia had two significant politicians. One is called Vladimir Putin, the other called Alexei Navalny. He was uh, the most able uh, professional opposition politician with a very formidable political machine uh, who managed to circumvent the state bans on elections, who managed to circumvent uh, the media monopoly by uh, building extraordinary presence uh, on the internet and the, in the YouTube, changing the agenda, managed to campaign despite being banned from standing in the elections, has created uh, effectively a party system uh, staffed with volunteers, crowdfunding, etc. Uh, he was and this is probably my last assertion, given that I'm coming to, to the end of my 10 minutes. He was the last uh, politician, or the only politician in Russia, who spanned both control of the street and the protest, who could um, both call people on the street and uh, they would come out, who could equally lead people away from the Kremlin, uh, as he did in, uh, in the protests of 2011 and 12. And he was somebody who um, staked his political future, at least for now, on the idea of elections. Uh, he did represent a massive threat to the system um, because he identified its core weakness, uh, which Katja Schulman um, has written extensively about uh, and talked about. Um, the, he understood that the system is not rested in the single power of Vladimir Putin, or the Duma. He understood that this is a consensual system of collective responsibility where corruption is the glue and therefore the uh, result, you know, Putin's ability to stay in power depends not on his charisma, although it's part of it, uh, but it depends on the consensus of the regional corrupt elites who benefit financially uh, from um, providing him with the necessary result in the election. It's a system held much less by repression or had been held much less by repression, much more, more by consensus. If you attack those cells, those individual cells, and you remove the foundation of uh, the platform on which the system rests, which is why the smart voting, the protest voting, which he's come up with, the local elections uh, were actually important. And as we've seen both in the protests in Moscow uh, last summer and in the protests in Khabarovsk, uh, the, uh, the, the election themselves might not be very exciting. The result, the sometimes delayed result of injecting politics into the, the regional elections is massive. Uh, so he has become a threat. Vladimir Putin has transformed the system through the constitutional changes into something much closer to dictatorship or supremacy, presidential supremacy. Uh, it's much less uh, stable, it's much less legitimate, and the avenue um, that offered at least some hope for Russia's transformation, for the regime's transformation, through a process at least 
you know, of elections or a process that combines an election and a street process, that element has been either removed or incap incapacitated, which makes the uh, a system much less stable. A constraint, a very important constraint, has been removed, which makes the system also more dangerous internationally. Uh, as Andrei Sakharov understood uh, only too well, uh, as somebody who has created the most powerful weapon in the, in the world history, uh, the removal of constraints at that point, the human rights uh, and the threat, nuclear threat, are uh, extremely closely intertwined. So I think we are in a moment of flux, we're in a moment where the systems are more brittle and the moment where uh, their instability could present threats to the outside world. Sorry for ex exceeding my time. No, that's about right. Thank you very much indeed, Arkady. That's, that's a great introduction. Uh, absolutely fascinating what you say. For, for what it's worth, I'm, I, I, my only doubt is whether you, you opened by saying that this is an historic moment, and I guess maybe I'm just jaded after the summer, whereas I, I can't help feeling we've been here before uh, many, many times, and therefore I, I can't quite see myself yet, and that's perhaps because I don't look at this as closely as you do, why we're at such an historic moment when, when this has been, uh, when, when I, I accept your point, he is the number two pop politician in Russia, that's a very good point, but at the same time, it, for me, it, it's still, the regime, to me, is not as brittle as you say it is. I, in Belarus, I accept the point, of course, but um, I haven't quite, maybe we can elaborate on that as we, as we um, I'm sure we will in discussion. Don't answer it now if you don't mind, because we ought to crack on. Yekaterina, I'm sure, will be more um, nitty gritty and detailed as she is talking about, as I said before, uh, the legislative process and the, gym, the forthcoming GMO elections. Over to you, Yekaterina. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity of addressing uh, this uh, very educated uh, audience and audience interested in all things uh, Russian. I would uh, agree with the previous speaker in saying that uh, while we should be cheery of uh, expressions like historic moment or the most dangerous moment for the last 30 years, one can't help feeling that we do experience uh, the final uh, moments, and these may be historically long moments, of a certain 30 years long cycle. Uh, there are transformations going on and while I'll be speaking about uh, new legislation and new rules laid out for uh, the future period, uh, again one can't help uh, doubting whether any sort of set of rules, whether any legislative frame adopted at this moment will hold out for any uh, historically significant period. Uh, we should, I think, follow these changes uh, they're worth uh, at least knowing about, but we should also keep in mind the possibility of it's not being the new norm uh, and uh, not being the new uh, stability which is going to stay with us for again the next uh, 30 years. We are in a transformative moment. We are not quite aware what we are transforming into. Uh, one of the reasons, the most evident reasons of this transformation is that uh, personalistic autocracies to which type both Russian and the Belarus political regimes belong uh, to a very great extent depend on the loyalty or at least, at least the passive loyalty uh, of the electorate. So uh, personal popularity of a leader is an important element uh, in the workings of political machine. And when these leaders start to experience the erosion of their personal popularity, what is uh, usually called uh, their downward trend in approval ratings, in the ratings of trust, it does necessitate uh, changes in the, both in the uh, legal legislative composition of the regime and in its political practices. Uh, if we keep this uh, important point in mind, then a lot of things become simpler to understand. In Russia, uh, since uh, the seemingly triumphant elections, presidential elections of 2018, we have been seeing this downward trend, sometimes faster, like in the summer of 2018, after the pension age reform, sometimes slower, but never a U-turn, never a change in the trajectory. And this brought the necessity of uh, the major rewriting of electoral legislation. 
Uh, as you may remember, the constitutional voting of July the 1st was conducted under the, according to the ad hoc uh, law written specifically for this one uh, unique electoral event. But uh, already in May of this year, during the uh, pandemic, during the lockdown, when not so much uh, public attention and when not, not so much media attention was directed towards the working of the State Duma, uh, the State Duma uh, under the, by the initiative of uh, United Russia. Now, fraction members adopted uh, what amounts to a major rehaul of Russian electoral legislation. Now it much closer resembles that of Belarus, allowing uh, preliminary uh, voting uh, during a uh, uh, from seven to three days uh, before the actual elections days, much more liberal rules for voting outside the voting booths, uh, at home voting, uh, long distance voting, electoral voting, etc. And at the same time, greatly restricting the access of independent candidates uh, to uh, elections of any level. Among other things, uh, we now have a much longer list of criminal code uh, and administrative code articles that prohibit a person who had once been, been uh, prosecuted uh, from uh, running for any electoral post. What does it mean? It means that uh, with the uh, declining uh, popularity, first of the United Russia Party, uh, and then also of the uh, president, it becomes impossible to deliver the necessary election results by any other means but non-admission. The non-admission of any potentially dangerous candidate or party uh, becomes the only instrument, the only way to ensure that the incumbent wins if he or she is a uh, regional, uh, head of regional administration, or the necessary candidates candidate wins uh, on uh, elections to legislative assemblies now, and the state uh, and the state duma. So the State Duma is a key element in any power transfer scenario, whatever form this scenario takes, whether it's from the incumbent to himself, whether it's from him to a successor, or whether it's from him to a collective body. Uh, all the three scenarios are possibilities. And in all three, it is absolutely necessary to uh, be sure of a loyal, loyalistic parliament. So the elections of 2021 will be our next key political event. We are going to have uh, elections, uh, regional elections, quite a large number of it. Uh, on uh, September 13th, the uh, unified uh, voting day. Uh, but this is a, a relatively smaller matter, though it's also important there are quite, quite a few uh, key uh, regions which are um, electing both their governors and uh, the regional assemblies or the uh, city dumas like in Novosibirsk. But uh, this should be perceived as a preparatory campaign uh, before the parliamentary campaign of 2021. And this is the first real voting, uh, not constitutional voting, but real elections that will be held according to this new set of rules, which the association of independent electoral observers Golas named the worst in 25 years. Uh, this set of rules certainly uh, looks uh, pretty ugly, but uh, again, here we should uh, remember what is the necessity uh, behind this. Uh, the State Duma had uh, adopted during the long spring session of 2020, uh, it has adopted and discussed the constitutional amendment themselves, but here the role of parliament was relatively minor. But uh, it also discussed and adopted a number of other legislative changes uh, into the details of which uh, we will not go uh, too deeply, but uh, the electoral reform I have mentioned, and during the uh, oncoming uh, autumn fall session, the main task of the Duma will be uh, the implementation of constitutional changes into Russian federal legislation. And here I would like to point three uh, directions, three uh, legislative uh, three potential bills that I think are important. Uh, the first is the uh, future law on the state council. As described in the new constitution, it's an absolute cat in the bag. 
It is just mentioned, but uh, not delineated. We do not know uh, what its composition will be, and most importantly, we do not know what its powers will be. It may remain the decorative institution that it is, that it currently is, or it may become a kind of new politburo, a collective body that uh, will be planned to restrict the future president, the successor of the incumbent. So this, uh, the, the possibilities are endless, and I do not think, given my, uh, well, given my experience with watching the legislative process in Russia, I do not think that anyone yet has a clear idea. I would suspect that there are a number of uh, projects uh, now circulating uh, in the presidential administration, and some will be uh, chosen according to the then existing political situation. And also, I do think that here, as in the case with many uh, bills and with a constitutional bill, itself, the key elements may be introduced during the second reading in order to have them passed faster and in order to, again, to circumvent uh, media attention. This is uh, priority, uh, priority number one. Uh, second, uh, the so-called system of public power, Sistema Publicne Vlasti, into which the municipal level needs to be implemented. This is implemented. This is a new term. It, is not ex it, it, ha it has not uh, existed in the Russian legal language before, publicna system of власти. So again, we do not know what that is. It's natural to suppose that uh, the municipalities uh, will become part of vertical of power. But here also other options are not impossible. Like, for example, the idea to uh, lessen the pressure within the system by introducing some degree of political competition on the lowest level, uh, for example, uh, to allow the cities to elect uh, their own mayors. This is a much discussed reform. Not that I believe it to be extremely probable, but it is not impossible as a kind of counterweight to uh, the governors. The introduction of a more uh, electable uh, mayors is, again, is a possibility. And uh, direction number three is the so-called federal territories, which are, again, mentioned in the new constitution, but not described. This may refer to the plans of, uh, for example, uh, uniting Moscow with Moscow region and eliminating Moscow mayoral elections. Again, I'm just naming uh, the, the possible scenarios, not that I think them to be very probable or imminent. But I would very much like to see what these federal territories are and how they will be described uh, in the new uh, legislation. I'm naming these uh, priorities because much more attention will be directed now at the uh, new legislation connected to uh, the so-called traditional values. Changes in the family code, like the one already introduced by Yelena Mizulina. By the way, it's not the only one. There's an alternative a bill introduced by Krasininikov and Klishas. Again, I'm sorry to be too detailed, but that's just my cup of tea, so I do think it's so terribly important. Other people may not have the same opinion. So my point is, uh, while there will be a lot of noise, I wouldn't like to call it noise, okay, people do care about these things, but there will be a lot of attention directed towards ideological or uh, religious looking or traditionally minded changes. Behind all this, and at the same time, there will be going on uh, discussions uh, and changes and implementation of bills that are of much more uh, influence on the general composition of Russia as a federation, so far as it is a federation, uh, and uh, on its system of checks and balances, so far as it has a system of checks and balances. Uh, a few words on uh, the future Duma elections uh, themselves. Uh, Arkady has described their new constitution as uh, being much closer to the dictatorship. Uh, to super presidential uh, model, but at the same time, paradoxically, it also raises the price of a state Duma mandate. It does give certain new, if not new powers, at least new additional visibility to the federal parliament. That will now have a role in at least discussing uh, 
uh, the uh, figure of the prime minister and of the ministers, other members uh, of the government. Uh, these people who will be elected deputies in 2021, by the way, at whichever date uh, the elections will take place, because they, uh, the, the scheduled uh, date is uh, in autumn, but there's a possibility it's been allowed by the Constitutional Court. Uh, there's a possibility of holding elections a little bit earlier. Uh, so they may happen in spring or uh, early summer uh, of 2021, uh, but that, that, is not, uh, that is not terribly important. So these people who will be elected uh, deputies will be present at the moment, the crucial, the dangerous moment of power transfer, presidential power transfer. Again, whenever it takes place, whether in 2024 or, or earlier, before that. Uh, the scenario where uh, constitutional reform happens, then parliamentary elections, and then uh, presidential elections is uh, evidently the one that uh, Moscow tries to uh, sell to uh, Minsk. And from this, we may judge that this is our own Russian scenario. So preterm uh, presidential elections are, again, are not uh, impossible. So how will these uh, elections play out? Uh, again, not going too deeply uh, into details, legislative or political, I would like to make one, one final point. Uh, remember the uh, Moscow City Duma elections of 2019. Uh, remember this sequence of events. First, there's elections which no one used to care about, and then suddenly, with the new uh, political atmosphere, people start caring about it, and they want, uh, a lot of candidates want to run. These candidates are barred from participating. There follow uh, protests on the part of potential voters. The candidates are not registered anyway. Uh, then elections happen, protest voting happen, smart voting, uh, and uh, a lot of non-united Russia uh, uh, City Duma members are elected. And the face of the city parliament changes. Uh, another possible uh, sequence of events is uh, protest voting, falsifications to nullify, or at least to smooth the effects of protest voting, and then protests against the falsifications, or rather against the results which are published as official, but are not accepted by the society as such. Again, let me agree with uh, Arkady. Uh, regimes like ours, and like the one in Belarus, they do rest on public consent. At least the uh, people in general, the citizens in general, need to agree that even if there were some unfair play, but the bulk, uh, the, the general uh, result is as it should be. It was like with the constitutional voting. Uh, a lot of people noted that the voting procedure was ridiculous. A lot of people noted that the results were in Moscow and Petersburg were probably not the ones published. But there was this general idea that actually, yes, Russia voted for the amendments. There was the majority, maybe not uh, 60, 62, uh, 72%, maybe, uh, maybe 60%, but still there was a majority. This is the uh, stable, relatively stable situation. But there happens a moment in the life of uh, personalistic autocracies when this stability fails. And then like in Belarus, people do not say, maybe it's not 80%, but maybe it's 60, but they say, no, it's 3%, which again may not be true, but we're not talking about realities, we're talking about perceptions and perceptions in a political process are all important. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Katarina. <laughs> there was a lot of fabulous detail in there on the State Council and a number of other things. Um, but still, what you said, it reminds me of something something told me many years ago, which is that uh, in order for things to stay the same, things are going to have to change. And that, in a way, sums up your presentation. Um, uh, you need to run very fast in order to stay in the same, exactly. uh, in the same spot. Saying. Yes, and yes. Maybe, Kolya, you can elaborate on that. Uh, I should have mentioned to you, ladies and gentlemen, Nikolai Petrov is speaking us from somewhere on the Adriatic coast in a manful um, uh, relinquishment of his holiday responsibilities and familiar responsibilities. Uh, he did actually design this seminar, um, but he has volunteered to, uh, to, to break for his holiday and, and come to us now. Uh, Kolya, over to you to talk about the significance of yesterday, um, the regions and anything else you can add to what the other two speakers have said. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, not only it's a privilege to participate in such a distinguished panel, uh, but uh, 
Uh, I do have special bonus. I am speaking the last, so it makes it possible for me not to repeat those points. I do agree with uh, my esteemed colleagues. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try to make eight brief uh, points to be as brief uh, as possible. Uh, my first point is that uh, Putin's Russian political regime, which we knew and which has undergone transfiguration in 2014, is over. And there is the new one. It's hard to foresee uh, now uh, a way how it will operate, but uh, I, I would agree with Arkady that it's much less stable and thus much more dangerous. Uh, my second point is that there are a lot of features which uh, have disappeared, and there are also uh, several new features. First of all, Putin's personal base of support, which after 2014 has made it possible for him uh, to circumvent uh, political elites, uh, has disappeared. And something should be changed just in order to compensate for this very special uh, weakening of the base of the political regime. Uh, elections are almost absent. Uh, not only, uh, uh, well, uh, they are not uh, uh, free and uh, fair in, uh, uh, well, anyway, but they do not even serve uh, their role of legitimizing the uh, regime. Political parties are extremely weak, including the so-called party of power. Uh, they, and the Kremlin does not pay any attention uh, uh, to them. So Navalny's uh, huge success in establishing the second uh, uh, political party, uh, except for the remainder of the communist political party, is very, very essential achievement. Political elites are almost absent in a sense that we do have a neo-nomenclaturian system where the influence of any element is almost totally defined by uh, uh, his or her position in the system, uh, either official or with regard to uh, Putin personally. Judiciary looks even much weaker now than it used to be a year ago. And we don't have a uh, constitution uh, at all. And this is very important. Uh, my third point is that there is collective Putin instead of this. Uh, we can call him great or expanded uh, Putin. Uh, however, Putin himself, I think, is one step away from uh, Lukashenko. His popularity is declining and stability of his regime, which uh, I think is uh, partially defined now by the fact that all uh, players are extremely weak. Uh, is uh, not that uh, stable in my view. Uh, my fourth, po uh, fourth point is that in absence of either popular or elite support, and I would not agree that Putin has managed uh, to consolidate elites, uh, he did manage uh, to threaten elites. And this is important that repressive apparatus uh, provides uh, for this kind of uh, quasi consolidation of the regime. And here I would mention not only Navalny case, but previous Furgal case and uh, Blikov case in Krasnoyarsk Krai as uh, very new usage of political repressions, not just to send signals and to threaten elites, but to fix uh, in a uh, spin doctor's way uh, political problems. So repressions now are vitally important just to fix certain problems and regime is faced by new and new problems of this kind. Siloviki, in my view, and uh, here is my fifth point, they do play a very instrumental role. They are totally uh, controlled uh, by the Kremlin. And it's very interesting to look at what's going on with regard to prosecution office. It wasn't good under Chaika. It's not, uh, I think, any better uh, from the point of view of ordinary citizen under uh, Ivan Krasnov, the new uh, prosecutor general. What is different is the fact that 
uh, Yuri Chaika uh, had a lot of connections and there was a kind of balance between interests of different elite groups and clans. Now Krasnov is absolutely technical head of the prosecution. Highest courts uh, should follow. And uh, you've heard perhaps that uh, Putin's classmate became deputy uh, chair of the Supreme Court instead of much younger and uh, well-positioned guy, which uh, looks, in my view, a development in uh, the same direction. Those guys uh, who are uh, bosses in law enforcement and security agencies should not be connected to any other elite groups but only to uh, the center, to Putin uh, himself, to Putin personally. The sixth point is that uh, is about center and regions, and I do totally agree with uh, Yekaterina uh, when uh, uh, she spoke in, uh, about federal territories, and uh, it's now a kind of a threat. It can be used in many different ways, but uh, the Kremlin now has uh, the constitutional right to change uh, the composition of uh, the country in many different ways. So uh, there are conflictual relations between the center and regions uh, with conflicts which uh, used to be conflicts between regions uh, themselves and the center. Now they are uh, conflicts in the regions between uh, representatives of the center in regions, and the governor now is a person who is a senior representative of uh, the federal center uh, in regions rather than representative of regional elites at the center. And uh, there is development, step by step development of this relationship between central and proper regional, central regional and proper uh, regional elites from separation between them to coexistence, peaceful coexistence between them, and to more and more confrontation uh, between them. As you know, uh, two thirds of governors uh, now are newcomers uh, who came uh, from outside their regions, and the average time term in office uh, for them is about two or three years, which makes them very loyal to the center and not very well connected to uh, regional, especially old uh, regional elites. There is also very tough financial control from the side of the federal center, so we should not uh, uh, only focus on how much money regions are getting, but we should focus on the fact that no more they are capable to spend this money uh, by their own decisions. It is given to regions, but they should spend this money according to orders coming from the federal center. And in my view, it creates a kind of a trap of increased control. The more uh, the Kremlin controls region, the less uh, regions are capable to develop, which I think is one of the basic conflicts uh, within uh, the system. The third point is that the reconfiguration is far from being finished. It did start this January, uh, but it's far from being finished at both institutional and personal levels. We've seen weakening of almost all institutions, but uh, there are no uh, new institutions which should be either established like the State Council, a new, or uh, which should strengthen. And this phase uh, will be much more conflictual for political elites than the previous one, because it should provoke conflicts both within elites and uh, within the whole system of management. And uh, in order to uh, foresee this, we should look at uh, the conflict between Sabanian's uh, state council group at the time of the intensive fight uh, against uh, the pandemic and uh, the government. So it's a good model which clearly demonstrates that the system has made only some initial moves which initially looked much less conflictual and should start now much more conflictual uh, moves. And my <clears throat> last point is that no more the model 
uh, as it appeared in January or the model which Putin could have in mind in mind in January is or can be in place. And proportions between proactive and reactive moves by the Kremlin, they have changed in a very essential way with uh, external changes, external, uh, well, uh, uh, restraints playing more and more important role and the system being forced to improvise and being forced to react rather than to go forward with realization of the whole initial plan of transfiguration. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Kolya. That's terrific. Really, really interesting. Um, whilst I wait for you, ladies and gentlemen, to, to tap your questions into the chat or to raise your electric, your electronic hands uh, in the participants function. Uh, I'll ask, I'll ask my, my, my own and hopefully people will come in uh, after me. Um, Arkady in particular, maybe Kolya too. I mean, I just want to come back to the brittleness of the regime point um, because as you say, people have been saying it for a long time. And if we'd had this discussion in 2015, um, just after the murder of Boris Nemtsov, um, and which was not long after the Euromaidan revolution, I suppose, as well. I, I remember back to, to those times, and of course, people were talking about the brutalness of a regime then. So I just want to ask you very explicitly, you know, what has changed now? Why is it brittle now in a way in which it presumably wasn't in, because it had another at least five years plus to run? So, that's, that's, so I, just, I just really want to, 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 to bring you out on that one, if I, if I can, Arkady. Uh, and, and also, I suppose, since you both mentioned the why this regime, this, you both mentioned this regime was more dangerous. And I also find that just a little bit hard to take because to me, it's always been quite, quite dangerous. And so I don't see how it's more dangerous now than it was when it's interfered in, you know, the US elections um, and, and locked off parts of other countries in the, in the past, well, actually 12, 12 or so years. So again, I just, I'd just like to know how the regime is more dangerous now than it was before, equally, I'm sure. So that's, that, that's, that's my challenge to you, if you don't mind. Maybe I'll start with Arkady and anyone else wants to come in after that can. Arkady. Thank you, James. Sorry, um, just unmuted. Um, yeah, no, these are both very good questions. Um, and as I acknowledge, you know, we, we have been saying this. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Uh, it just means we obviously can't predict the timing. And it also it depends on what your expectation is as a result of the outcome of this, of, of this brittleness. Um, I would say that uh, the regime was brittle then, it is more brittle now. Um, you know, it's a crystal structure which very little flexibility and less, uh, and less ability to withstand external shocks. That's how I would, I would describe this or to absorb those shocks. Um, you know, there is this idea, you know, there is this, um, notion of of the um fatigue in the metal you know the metal fatigue uh which you just never know you know it's building up you never know when the where the breaking point is um so i think uh, these are not contradictory things it's not that it wasn't brittle in 2014 and is more you know and is brittle now it was brittle then it is more brittle now um the difference is um this in my mind that in 2014 uh, and Navalny again comes into it. Uh, after the protests in, it, you know, it's a process, it's not just a single point. You know, after, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this sort of a process after 2011 and 12, when, when Putin basically broke the spirit of the constitution, came back into power, uh, was greeted with those protests, uh, which Navalny has managed to galvanize um, very effectively. Putin relied less on hard repression. It was more of a threat of repression, targeted repression, and more on uh, be it unorthodox means of reinstating his legitimacy. Uh, partly through the events in, um, in Ukraine, uh, which have worked as a deterrent uh, in much of the former Soviet space, and you know, we expect it to be an inspiration, actually worked as a deterrent because it was plunged into chaos to similar uprisings elsewhere, but mostly because of the annexation of Crimea. And the novelty of the war um, and the, the fact that the economy was still re relatively in good shape and the war provided sort of entertainment and, and justification for the feel-good factor 
all these things allowed Putin to um, confirm his legitimacy. It, as I said, it was less about repression. It was more about the national euphoria, extension of territory, uh, affirmation of legitimacy through traditional uh, imperial Russian means of expanding territory. Uh, that my assertion that it's more brittle now, and we can see this in the uh, poisoning of Navalny, which is a very brazen act. And I do think it's it's different from from Boris Nemtsov, in that Nemtsov, um, we all, you know, most of us, many of us knew him personally, loved him, and he was an important person as a symbol of the liberal values. But he was not an effective. Uh, you know, he did not represent a real political force or, or didn't have that significant a following of the, of the kind that Navalny commands. Um, so we see that the, the means by which Putin can reaffirm his legitimacy, as Katya has been saying, is shrinking. We know from the opinion polls that people no longer excited about foreign adventures. In fact, they're irritated by them. That limits the room for maneuver. Uh, we um, know that the economy has run out of steam and we don't foresee any significant, it will be in stagnation at best for a long period of time. We don't see any spike in economic activity because there is no competition in the system. Um, and now we have a third and a very interesting element which we haven't really talked about, uh, which is the use of violence and repression. Because we've, we've talked uh, for a long time about, we, we anticipate at this moment that this regime will fall on violence uh, the, as its last resort. That ultimately it will come very quickly to the question, can it actually use that, you know, that repression, can it shoot people? Uh, very new, you know, the new information basically we've just received from Belarus. We suspected it and political scientists like Ekaterina Schulman told us, but we actually haven't seen the evidence of it. And now we, we sort of have that the use of repression uh, without legitimacy uh, doesn't shore up the regime. It actually delegitimizes it much, much faster. Uh, we kind of saw this in Ukraine uh, in 2013-14 Maidan, when the real Maidan protest started after the beating of the students. Uh, but it's very evident now is that Lukashenko has first stolen an election, lost his sort of electoral or sort of popular legitimacy, and then within two days lost the rest of it in the use of violence, which actually uh, made the situation much, much, much worse. And this might, might explain why Putin sort of hesitated uh, to immediately lash out in, in, in Khabarovsk. Because it's one thing, you know, Putin has never been scared of taking on the elites. He's been much more scared of of this sort of the notional myth, mythological, whatever you want to call it, in a body of nation, a body of people. Uh, so the instruments through which he stays in power are weaker. The use of violence is not clear how how that will work. Um, and the what Kolya uh, and I just you know with both Kolya and Katya, my takeaway from it, it very very interesting presentations is um, that the threats. Uh, to Russia itself and Russian integrity now stands kind of moved to the regional level. You know, the question becomes not an academic, it's no longer an academic question whether Russia can break up. So that's why it's more brutal. And in terms of, um, you know, danger to the world, well, I think it just comes from that, that a regime which has fewer constraints domestically through political, you know, Navalny was a check, you know, he, he provided some form of, of a check uh, on power. Uh, a regime which is unconstrained uh, and desperate can uh, resort to more desperate measures, um, as we've seen in the case of uh, Lukashenko. Can I just say, finish with saying, you know, hopefully it will never come to that, but the, so the noises that Lukashenko has been making uh, by by organizing drills on the Belarusian western border, by saying this is Lithuania and Poland trying to invade our space, it's one mm -hmm. step away from a mad and desperate dictator launching a provocation 
uh, dressing whoever you want, you know, in Polish uniform and launching an attack and then calling for collective action. We always talked about Article 5 in, 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 in terms of NATO, but what if actually he calls on, on Putin to provide collective response to a provocation launched by the regime from the Western borders? Thank you very much, Arkady. Very good comeback. Totally reasonable. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't going to work if I ask all three presenters to respond to every single question because there's now a lot of questions coming in uh, in both uh, formats. So uh, I will try to get just maybe one, maybe two speakers to answer a future questions. Um, I will go first to Katya Glod, who I think is probably in Belarus. You may want to correct me. I'm not entirely sure. We'll unmute you, Katya. We'll try. Can we unmute Katya Glod, please? Yep, yes and no. It happened for a second. Yes, Katya, you're on. Yes, no, it's working. Yeah, thank you very much, James. And thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and for dedicating also so much time to Belarus. I'm back from Belarus literally a few days ago, so I'm now safely uh, safely back in London. And if I may, um, just to very briefly continue the topic of Belarus and ask Yekaterina Schulman specifically, because she's not only the most popular person in Belarus, but, uh, sorry, in Russia, but she's also the most uh, um, uh, the most uh, respected uh, political analyst in Belarus as well. And, she, and Katerina, you have made quite a few comments on the situation in Belarus, which were very helpful to understand it. And I have one particular question. Um, you were, uh, the question is about the role of the protests. Uh, and um, uh, in one of your programs, you said that protesters will be taken to the streets uh, over and over again and then coming back, but eventually that will create the pressure on the elites, on the ruling elites, and they start to defect. And I was wondering how, how you see that happening in Belarus. We certainly have these currently very horizontal, uh, very extensive protests, and I don't see people sort of stopping and, uh, um, and not doing it in the future. Uh, at the same time, there is a very hierarchical, vertical, monolithic um, uh, regime structure. So where do you see the possibility for the protesters to pressure the ruling elite to finally defect? Thank you. Okay, Yekaterina, uh, if you want to take that one, then uh, we'll, uh, that's, I'm sorry for the discussion generally is a little more unfocused than it might normally be, but that's because of, uh, because of okay, the... Okay, that's the because of the situation the uh, we are in. Uh, so we are answering questions immediately as they arise, right? Please. Good, good. Uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, I absolutely deny the uh, rumors of my being the most popular uh, political analyst in Belarus. I have no confirmation for this whatsoever, but uh, I did mention the protesters' ability to persist in their protest activity, and if not to increase, it, at least not to lessen their visible numbers as one of the factors uh, of the protest mm -hmm. effectivity. Uh, there were five factors in all. One is uh, the one I named, uh, the second is the ability to create parallel power structures, starting with uh, independent counting of votes and ending with uh, people's governors and people's mayors. Uh, the third uh, was the uh, defection, as you said, of the elites, or at least the appearance of elite figures expressing sympathy uh, for the uh, protest movement or resigning uh, in, in favor of uh, their support of their, because of their support uh, of the protesters. Uh, and uh, number uh, four was the uh, position of uh, international community. Now, how the uh, capitals of the big, big powers uh, react and what measures they take, whether they uh, recognize the election results and whether they uh, support uh, the alternative uh, president, the alternative uh, power vertical, which is being, or power horizontal, which is being created. Uh, we see in Belarus partly uh, the presence of all those factors. And by the way, there was one more factor, the uh, diversification of the instruments of protest, because you cannot just keep going out on the streets. It's a nice thing to do. It must be done. But the uh, other instruments must appear, like strikes, for example, or or uh, those creative uh, types of expressing their protests that uh, the Belarusians are uh, so good at. So we see to an extent all those five factors present in the Belarus protest movement, but uh, we see the persistence, we see the numbers, we see uh, diversifications of the instruments, but we have not seen the all national strike. There were some 
episodes, but it has not developed into an all-country uh, campaign, into a full stop of uh, the country's industrial activity. Now, we see uh, some uh, parallel power structure, at least in the uh, form of Coordination uh, Soviet Coordination uh, Council, but we have not seen yet people's mayors or people's governors appear in any territories of Belarus. Something like that started to appear in Grodna, if I'm right, but uh, was uh, stopped uh, by the intervention of uh, Minsk. And we do see a certain support uh, from on the part of international community. Uh, this is also a factor, although it's not crucial, whatever. The autocrats themselves say internal factors are more important than external ones. What we do not see is elite defection, at least not to the extent that touches the all important uh, Siloviki community. So far, they have to a most extent remain loyal to uh, the president, the acting president, which means that uh, they think that keeping the status quo is more to their advantage than changing it to some new political situation. So long as they think this, so long as no one among them gets the ambition of becoming the next president or the next minister of defense, if he changes sides soon enough. Uh, the president of Belarus, uh, given the, well, so that degree of support which has been allotted to him by Russia has a chance to at least to win some time. Mm -hmm. uh, at least to win some time for uh, those necessary consultations and bargaining, which usually constitute the power transfer in more realistic scenarios, rather than the presidential uh, palace being stormed by revolutionary crowds. Usually this power transfer happens uh, much more behind the scenes, that it's not so spectacular and it takes some time. Okay. The frame proposed by Russia, one last thing, is evidently again constitutional reform, uh, then parliamentary elections, then presidential elections. Uh, this this is a more or less viable scheme if only uh, the president of Belarus buys it. Understood. Thank you very much, uh, Ekaterina. I'm keen to get back to Russia, of course. More importantly than that even, uh, there is half an hour left and I've got about a dozen questions. So uh, I'm not going to do them necessarily in order, but if I could ask both questioners and, well, I'll be the question because I'll read them out, uh, but certainly the, uh, the panelists to, be, to give brief answers if they may. Um, the next is from Domitia Sagramoso. Domitia asks, uh, is Putin still seen as the figure who can hold the country together? How strong is the view that without Putin, there is no Russia? Can I turn to you for that, Kolya, please? How strong is the view that without Putin, there is no Russia? Can he still hold it together in the eyes of the people? Uh, well, I think that uh, there is no competition between mm -hmm. any politicians at the top. So, and I do believe that uh, Putin's political regime is so personalistic uh, that there is no way uh, to succeed without uh, not undertaking very serious changes in the regime. And this, by the way, is what about the configuration we to discuss now is about. So I think that uh, uh, we can agree with uh, Volodin, uh, that without Putin, there is no Russia of, uh, uh, well, uh, the way we do see it. So in Putin's absence, whether staged by Putin himself and the Kremlin, or uh, while taking place without their will, uh, Russia and Russian political regime will be different. Thank you very much indeed. You surprised me by the variety of your answer. Thank you. Uh, let's move to uh, Anders Osland. Uh, who says that the, uh, if I can find it, I've lost Anders' question, here we are. Uh, Anders says he's missing the economic aspect. Putin has made a program until 2030, which aims at real, st stable real incomes. Uh, R Russia has no economic development program at all. GDP has stagnated since 2014 and real disposable incomes have fallen by 15%, says Anders. Uh, why, keep the de 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 <laughs> why keep the dysfunctional Putin regime? Uh, can I turn to you for that, Arkady, please? Ah, we lost Arkady, in fact. We, he's just come back into the waiting room, I see, Anna. If you can readmit Arkady. We've obviously mm -hmm. lost his... Let me just get... I'll give him a couple of seconds. If not, I'll, I'll adjust. Arkady, are you there? No, that was unfortunate timing. 
Right. James, you know, while Arkady is coming, I can start answering this question. Uh, okay, I, I'm, that's fine. Uh, yeah, fine. Sorry, yeah. uh, no, Arkady. Yes, but I'm, I'm really sorry my internet connection went, so if there it's was a fine. question... Arkady, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Right, so the question is from, from Anders Osland. Anders says he's missing the economic aspect. Um, Putin has made a program until 2030 which aims at stable real incomes. Russia has no economic development program at all. GDP has stagnated since 2014 and real disposable incomes have fallen by at least 15 percent. So, so Anders, with his usual provo provocative nature, asks why keep the dysfunctional Putin regime, bearing in mind the economic problems? Uh, well, because the uh, th uh, you know, because, you know, the uh, inter-elite threat, uh, inter-elite repression is still there. Um, um, there is a... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. you're, fluxing, you're fluxing in and out, but keep going, and if, we, if, we, if I have to change you, I'll, I'll switch to the call you. Yes, please. Uh, so I think there is still a sort of a threat of repression. Um, mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, there is also um, the threat of um, uh, there is still consensus of the elites and the fear that if Putin goes, uh, they basically, to put it very simply, have stolen so much uh, that and done so much, bad, so many bad things um, that somebody like Navalny might come. Uh, so there is there is a fear of of what will happen if he is not there. If not Putin, then who? Uh, there is a fear of Russia uh, disintegrating and moving back uh, to sort of a fear. Mm. And um, in the situation of, of Belarus, uh, it's, it's often about uh, injustices rather than just economic incomes um, that, that uh, spurs the protests. Okay, Kolya, you wanted to add something very briefly on the economic dimension. Thank you, Akadi. Yeah, I am not an economist, as you know, rather economic geographer. But what I'd like to say is uh, that uh, uh, Navalny's case, I think, can be a game changer, not in the sense that the West now will react in a way which, uh, uh, well, would influence uh, what uh, will go on next in Russia, but in a different way. At the beginning of this transfiguration uh, process in January, uh, the idea was to distribute money in order uh, to demonstrate that uh, incomes and life level do increase and in order to make this uh, transformation of the system uh, much easier. It didn't work due to the epidemic, and uh, now it's absolutely understandable that there is no way for regime to count on any serious economic achievements, even in a short while, uh, if to distribute money and uh, to create a kind of a vision of uh, economic well-being. That's why I think uh, what uh, can follow after all these uh, serious events now, it's movement into a very different direction, uh, demonstrating, well, in direction of besieged fortress, demonstrating that uh, Russia can be seen as an uh, island of stability surrounded by the West, which is conspiring against Russia all the time. And if so, then uh, what has happened to Navalny uh, should be seen not as a mistake made by secret services, but as a cold-blooded decision to change mm -hmm. agenda and to use very different way how to restore Putin's uh, trust to Putin. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, there's a couple of questions on the opposition and political parties, one from Rebecca Lofner, one from Alex uh, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and from, one from Alex Folks. Uh, how will the role, this is for Yekaterina, I think, how will the role of a systemic opposition evolve as the regime faces an election cycle and grapples with the legitimacy, legitimacy questions? And, and Alex also added to that, you know, what is the future for the United Russia Party and, and even LDPR? Yekaterina, if you may. 
Uh, yeah. About the uh, systemic opposition, uh, yeah. it's interesting to see that, for example, the Communist Party is experiencing some kind of pressure uh, from the presidential administration at the moment. They're seeing the uh, mass uh, decline uh, to register uh, their candidates in many regions uh, where they wanted to run uh, on uh, September 13th. Uh, partly, it may be a revenge for the way they reacted to constitutional uh, amendments. They were uh, very vocal. Uh, the Communist Party very vocal against the amendment and the uh, Communist uh, Party uh, member of uh, Moscow City uh, Election Commission uh, actually uh, refused to uh, accept uh, the results of constitutional voting and tried to uh, go to court with this case, but didn't succeed. But still, again, they made a lot of negative uh, noises uh, in, the, in the public sphere. This may be one reason, but there are other less symbolic reasons uh, in the uh, city where there is a great demand for any sort of oppositional looking candidates or just alternative candidates. Uh, any party that has the parliamentary privilege that is that can register uh, candidates and party lists without having to collect signatures attracts this sort of voters energy which uh, sometimes it didn't ask for. Uh, everyone knows that the role of systemic opposition is to stay in the corridor allotted to them, not to uh, get too uh, successful and not to fail too badly. So if they win too many mandates, it's as bad as winning none at all. Uh, for example, there's the example of Yablaka Party, who decides to, who has a very uh, definite decision to stay comatose, as, as uh, it's the popular word, with our discussion. And recently we had a, a public uh, letter published, an article published by Grigory Yavinsky, which says this in so many words, we mm -hmm. will not. Uh, participate in anything that goes, we are going to survive for, for some purpose to outlive uh, Putin and then to, to suddenly to come into power or whatever. Uh, this is one tactic. Uh, but if you are a party like LDP or, Ili or uh, the Communist Party, then you need to uh, participate in elections and you experience great pressure from below because uh, a number of uh, young, active, politically active people, especially in the regions, in the municipalities, they want to become candidates and they use these parties just as vehicles. At the same time, the two major uh, parliamentary parties, the Liberal Democratic and the, in the Communist Party, will uh, shortly, uh, in a short time, will have to undergo their own power transfer process for natural reasons. So there's quite a big heritage to fight about, especially in the case of uh, KPRF. In case of the Liberal Democratic Party, it's more of the one-man orchestra. The party may not survive uh, the, the change of leadership. Yeah. But uh, the Communist Party is a real party. It has regional structures, it has volunteers, ideology, recognizable symbols, uh, and real uh, presence in the uh, assemblies, in the regional legislative assemblies, and among the uh, governors. So there's quite a lot going on, and it's worth watching. Again, let me repeat one of my key uh, points. It's dangerous and unwise to dismiss the elements of political system as decorative if the, if the system is not democratic. If we do not have a real, uh, par the real parliament in the sense developed democracies have, it doesn't mean that parliament does nothing or has no role or no importance. That's what Alexei Navalny understood so well, that elections are important and that legislative assemblies, collective bodies uh, are important. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. It's interesting what you say about the Communist Party because people have been telling me to watch the Communist Party for years and how significant and important it is, but I've never quite been able to see how it's not dying, despite what you're saying about its capacities. It, it's um, not dying anytime soon. Yeah, and I we know. know that the younger generation has leftist sympathies. And mm -hmm. just imagine a new generation of leaders coming after Gennady Zyuganov and revamping the party into something more socialist democratic okay. and then becoming a real oppositional force. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good. Come back again. Um, uh, Arkady, can you hear me? I know you switched to your mobile phone. Can we, un uh, you may, we may need to unmute you, in fact, if you can't unmute yourself. You can probably hear me, but can we unmute Arkady? Yes. I can, Arkady, I can, can hear, you. hear you. Great. I can hear you. Arkady, I'm going to ask Janet Gunn's question to you, please. Is the timing of the attack on Navalny connected with a sense of, uh, a sense in the Kremlin of being squeezed between protests in the Far East and in the West, and to make quite sure that they don't spread to the centre? Look, th this is where we move into territory. None of us, you know, anything we say would be speculation. Sure. Just sure. As, as, you know, it's the same as asking sure. sort of what, 
what are the motives or what, what's, the, what's going on inside the Kremlin or inside Putin's head. In a way, um, I think for the purposes of sort of observation on this regime, it's, it's sort of almost irrelevant. We don't know mm -hmm. okay. what were the arguments that they were sort of bringing up. The fact that it happens now has certain historical logic um, and sort of political historic logic. And I think that's all we have to go on. In a way, I, you know, th this is the worst time to try to decode, uh, decipher what's happening inside the Kremlin. They live in their own world. Uh, you know, our, you know, it's, it's its biggest weakness in a way is, is, is not re living in the, in the real world. Uh, but for those of us who do, we just have to observe the events, pay attention to public rhetoric, uh, pay attention to public events and, and they begin to make sense. I mean, um, just before we started this um, uh, conference, uh, Katya Schulman has shared this news, which has now become uh, more, more of a uh, news of Alexander Lukashenko uh, telling Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin, who is in Minsk, that he's intercepted a conversation between Poland and Germany. Uh, the essence of it, which is that um, the the statement, German statement about uh, Novichok, was uh, was fake news, and it was designed to keep Russia away from Belarus. Now, th this is a kind of madness uh, we we we're dealing with inside their heads, but uh, th the consequences are real. So, uh, you know, I think all we need to do at the moment is to pay attention and to mark this moment and and reflect on the changes in the configuration of the Russian regime, and therefore as a sort of collective West or whatever's left of it, to make provisions for uh, the moments, you know, of, of threat and, and danger. Uh, it does raise in my mind, I mean, a slight possibility. Um, again, for example, you know, what if uh, the, you know, Alexander Lukashenko and his man, his security services had anything to do uh, as a completely outlandish thought, had anything to do with the poisoning of Navalny. Mm -hmm. Now, even that, if, you know, as conspiracy theories, actually wouldn't change the calculation because exactly. it's the cover-up, it's the Kremlin's cover-up, it's, you know, collective responsibility, it's denying, refusing to investigate, etc., that we in a way care about, rather than who administered yeah. this poison. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to come to you, please, uh, Collier, again, with a question from Richard Wright. Uh, it's a very Collier petal of question. Navalny has been building a regional structure for some years. How effective is it, and could it be an effective catalyst in generating regional opposition to the Putin regime, aligned, perhaps, with regional elites sidelined by the Kremlin's centralization of political power? Complex question for you, Collier. I can repeat it if you like. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to bridge uh, this question on Navalny and on political parties partly. Yep. I think uh, that the Kremlin uh, plays uh, uh, political games in elections having pretty short time horizon. And the fact that it's possible to make deals with federal party leadership, with Zuganov, with Zhirinovsky, at the expense of regional party leaders means that the conflict within political parties is increasing. And uniqueness of Navalny uh, is in effect that, well, he's, he's not the leader of the opposition, but he's a unique person who is capable uh, to consolidate, to bring together very, very different factions in the opposition and to overplay even federal leadership of certain political parties. And it is creating understandable problem for the Kremlin, not only in terms of Navalny's game as such, but in terms of increasing the conflict between, say, regional communist leaderships and uh, the federal leadership represented mm -hmm. by Zugan. That's why in discussion whether it was needed for the Kremlin to exclude Navalny from the game or not, I would strongly agree with those who are saying that it was very needed for the Kremlin uh, on the eve of coming state Duma elections more than uh, with regard to uh, regional elections. And Navalny is unique in at least two different ways. Uh, last year, he did create, he did establish this huge horizontal structure 
which is absolutely unique. It's real party, although it has been not registered by uh, the Kremlin, but it's the one which is led by him in a very efficient way. And second, he did come with this smart voting model, which uh, creates huge risks for the Kremlin, because in uh, coming Duma elections, the stake has been made on single mandate districts, where you can use your administrative resource much better than in voting for party lists. But if Navalny was capable to uh, orchestrate smart voting last year during Moscow City Duma elections, it could be, it can be, it will be repeated next year in elections to the state uh, Duma. That's why, uh, well, mm -hmm. if not to develop political parties, and this is exactly what we do think uh, is going on or is not going on uh, in Russia, then you should eliminate all different risks to this. Thank you very much indeed, Kolya. Um, yeah, Kathleen, I'll turn to you, but I'll ask Anna Davidson from the University of Oxford to ask it personally. She's put her electronic hand up. So, Anna, over to you. I know your question is about public consent realities and perceptions. Thank you, James. Um, yes, thank you to all our panelists for the uh, really valuable discussion. Uh, Catherine, like James said, I have a question specifically for you uh, because you mentioned public consent as a source of legitimacy for personalistic autocracies. And then you also briefly touched on realities versus perception. And it's important to reinforce the, the perception of public consent. My question is, is it even possible to create a perception of public consent to support a personalistic autocracy when the reality is so starkly in contrast to that perception? Well, uh, there are limits to the possibility of creating a false impression, but uh, we've seen these limits in the case of Belarus again, which we're referring to again and, and again, but if you do have the monopoly on state TV, uh, you have quite large capabilities of imposing uh, these false impressions and this completely uh, unrealistic uh, picture of what society is, of what people want, whom they really support, uh, what, what is the mood of the people People, you can impose it on the people and then of course it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, because it's a uh, it's a norm uh, for a person to uh, try to follow the majority it may not be the most noble co course of behavior but it's the most natural one we are social creatures and we confirm to social norms and if we are told that everyone uh, loves and supports the president except a certain marginalized uh, minority uh, who are on the pay uh, of the West then we being good loyal abiding decent citizens want to be the good majority, not the bad minority. Again, this uh, course of policy has its limits, but I would attract your attention to the concept of informational uh, autocracies, uh, as recently developed by uh, Daniel Trisman and uh, Sergei Guriev. Uh, it's one of the many names of these new types of autocracies. We call them uh, hybrid regimes, we call them competitive or electoral autocracies, or uh, yes, personalistic or party autocracies. There are types. Uh, but these are the political models that rely uh, on 80% of propaganda and 20% of force, as the saying is. So uh, in Russia, I do think that this loyalistic core, which is essential, for the preservation of stability as understood by uh, political machines of this type is still in place, but it is experiencing erosion. This is a very slow process. It's like dissolving of a big lump of sugar in hot tea and the tea is not so hot, uh, not yet. So it's been going on since uh, it started, by the way, in 2016, because if you, if you follow the polls, then you'll see two years period of national euphoria, the so-called Crimean consensus, 2014, 2016. Then we had our plateau moment, two years of relative stability. And then uh, starting 2018, we have this unstoppable downward trend. Uh, now it's 2020. Uh, we'll see what happens on September 13th. 
uh, and we'll see uh, we'll see what the developments uh, will be next. Uh, it, it, this process is also connected to the change in um, uh, media habits of uh, Russians. Uh, to put it simply, more and more people are on the internet rather than uh, on TV. And it's not the point is not that internet is liberal and pro-Western, while uh, TV is loyalistic and traditional. The point is that it's a different type of information <coughs> consumption. It educates uh, the uh, reader, the viewer, in a different way. Uh, watching TV is a passive activity, but watching this same Salaviov program on YouTube is a political action because the very fact of your viewing it uh, changes the number of views. You can put a like or a dislike. You can share it. You can comment. So again, it, it indicates a different sort of person who in term in in, in time becomes uh, a different sort of citizen thank you very much indeed dear Katerina. Uh, i'm going to ask one more question of arkady and then i'm going to ask a question to all of you which has been asked by others anyway it's not it's not my question but arkady i'm going to ask you uh, you can still hear me arkady on your mobile phone yeah i can yeah. hear you fine uh, i'm going to ask you jeffrey hoskins question which is just the role of economic conglomerates and oligarchs in all of this please well, um, first of all, you know, we have to, to define, uh, there is no simple answer to that question. First of all, we have to define sure. oligarchs. I mean, if we go by oligarchs as, as sort of their historical name, uh, as those rich men in the 1990s, uh, the likes of uh, Patanian, Friedman, Aben, um, they don't have a role to play uh, politically now. Um, I think they have a role to play in this sort of a next or sort of a longer term game. They have created some of them very successful private enterprises. They have been, in Kaiser's words, sort of educating uh, people. Actually, they've been breeding people, you know, the very people who uh, might, uh, you know, and do object to, mm -hmm. to the regime. Uh, they don't have an immediate political role, they're not in the immediate political circle, and they will continue to distance themselves, safeguard uh, their wealth and um, their physical um, safety, and particularly the safety of their children through, uh, West, you know, by Western means. That's why we see them, you know, we, we have been observing this process of mo them moving out, uh, not in a way to, to channel Kremlin's interests, uh, but to um, to produce some sort of property rights and, and the, the mechanism for um, transferring their inheritance uh, through Western institutions. It is one of the stresses of the systems that the, um, I think as de Tocqueville said, you know, if you want to understand how the system works, look at the inheritance. Uh, there is no system of inheriting wealth uh, in Russia that is safe, uh, given that the uh, property rights are completely conditional on the will of those uh, who command uh, the Kremlin. Now, there is another circle of the oligarchs, the Putin cronies, um, who um, are clearly completely dependent uh, on Putin staying in power, who do not have any mechanism, who do not have the West as a mechanism of, of transferring their wealth uh, to their children, uh, who are already on some of the sanctions list, who know that their wealth will last only as long uh, as, as Putin is there. Um, and they, they create a risk group. Uh, they have a very vested interest in Putin uh, staying in power. Um, and they will continue to finance. Um, and I think they will be the last probably to defect. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, right, I'm going to ask a final question. We're five minutes to the hour. And I know Yekaterina in particular has to go on time. And I want to finish pretty much on time. Uh, and it's a, sort of an academic question combined with a practical one. So a lot of people have asked about how do we characterize the regime right now? Tony van der Todt said, is it Fortress Russia? Um, and uh, Fernando Herrero asked similar questions. Is what do you know, what do we call this? A kleptocratic uh, autocracy? And of course, uh, Arkady himself said, we're moving into dictatorship territory now, which is a, certainly a word I've always been cautioned against using myself. And you know, semi-authoritarian regime is what has, has traditionally been the case or something like that. So my question is, uh, how do we characterize a regime? But since labels are relatively academic, uh, Tony van der Tott also asked, of course, what do we do about it? So the obvious question to finish with is what do we do about it? So I'll start with you, Katerina, um, then Arkady and finish with, uh, with Kolya, sorry. Katerina. 
Uh, very good question. Uh, political science has many uh, names at its disposal. I have uh, already named a few titles for the characterization of this, again, new type of autocracies that have largely emerged uh, after the end of the Cold War, after the uh, 90s. Uh, but uh, I do not think that we need to play this game of names. I will name three basic features of the regime. Well, while they stay in place, the regime is the same as it was. When something uh, among the three changes, then we do have real regime transformation. Feature number one, and again, that's, that's, in, that's just my opinion. Uh, feature number one, the mixture of power and money. Power brings money, but not the other way around. Uh, enrichment is possible for those who occupy a certain place in the state hierarchy. This is our uh, feature number one. Uh, feature number two, uh, the mixture of political and administrative features. This is the model where uh, the bureaucrats make political decisions and play political roles, while the parliaments, for example, and elected uh, figures and elected bodies are consistently downplayed. This is another feature. And number three, this is a regime that strives as a means of its survival and, and perpetuation for the control of the public sphere. This includes uh, control over uh, political debate uh, and election process via uh, legislative uh, means. Uh, electoral legislation. This includes, of course, the most visible side, uh, control over the media, especially mass media, uh, television, and uh, to an extent where, uh, to an extent where, how, where it can, uh, control over the internet, and general uh, care, great care being given to great attention, great resources being spent on the informational side of the regime, the picture, the presentation, the perception. So these are the three, uh, three tools of death, to quote the name of one of Chesterton's uh, stories. Uh, if we see all three present, then we have our competitive autocracy, electoral autocracy, informational dictatorship, whatever. If, again, something changes here, then we have another type uh, of, of a political model. Competitive autocracy, understood. Autocracy um, is, you can is quite a, ask good, answer the question term. of what to do about it, but I'll leave, I'll leave that to others. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. If you do have to go at three o'clock uh, Moscow time, then... Thank you. Then I, I, want to, I want to listen to yeah. my okay. colleagues answering so, this question. Uh, uh, so, Arkady, over to you. Uh, how do we categorize the regime now? You did say dictatorship earlier, so I'll push you on that. Um, and what do we do about it? And I will try to wiggle out of it now um, <laughs> by, uh, by simply saying that I, I agree with you, James. I don't think that actually labels um, dictatorship, fascism, whatever, are very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, they don't describe um, where we are, um, and they in some ways mislead us by by bringing up yeah. par you know, historical parallels. I think yeah. we, uh, so if I could rephrase that moment, uh, that question and sort of come yes. back to the issue where we are. Um, and I think we are, uh, you know, what this regime looks like. And some of it is now intuitive. I'm not a political scientist, I'm, I'm a journalist um, and a bit, you know, a bit historian, but um, it feels like we're in a, uh, whatever you want to call it, either sort of a terminal phase of the post-Soviet order and disintegration of a state, or we're at the beginning of 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 a of a, of a new of a new period in in Russian or sort of post-Soviet history. But you know, I think what we're seeing are all the elements of um, uh, disintegration uh, of of statehood or, or the way we've we've seen it uh, before, and the use of violence. Uh, or the decentralization of violence as one of its, its features. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to, as a footnote, um, bring up is that um, we haven't mentioned at all Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to bring Ukraine into it now in any meaningful way. But the interesting difference between the events in Belarus and in Ukraine, which bear a lot uh, of, which are sort of significant for Russia, is that of course, Lukashenko's regime is much more totalitarian. You know, there was no private property to speak of. There were no rival groups. There are no regions. There is very little sort of differences. Uh, easier to control. In Ukraine, uh, the state could never control, uh, had never had anything similar to the control that Lukashenko has. Different oligarchic groups, more pluralism, regions, etc. And I would say that Russia, in that sense, is actually closer for all the you know, differences notwithstanding to Ukraine. There are too many differences. It's, it's much harder to rule as a totalitarian regime at this day and age. So I think the move towards um, 
okay, dictatorship of supremacy, presidential supremacy, is not contradictory, but actually sure. is a phase in, in this dangerous moment. In terms of how we respond, I think by two, uh, two tools, two means. Uh, one is uh, you have to prepare for this moment by building as many uh, uh, deterrence as possible uh, and, and defenses to all the uh, military and hybrid threats. Uh, but the most important element, I think, is you have to go back, and this is my sort of new sort of mantra, if you like, you have to go back to the arguments uh, of the post-Nixon years. Um, you have to recognize the fact, and that this has to be done by, by Western politicians, and I'm glad to see that Angela Merkel is already moving in that direction. You have to recognize that uh, crime, domestic crimes in Russia and domestic affairs in Russia and the abuse of human rights and the poisonings of the kinds we've seen is not a domestic Russian affair, that mm. they are actually linked with the question of international security. And they have to be linked to the question of inter international security explicitly in the way that they were done in the 1970s, where the nuclear uh, arms control agreements were trade uh, where all sorts of relationships which had to do with economy, diplomacy, and military were linked to the questions of the abuse of human rights. Uh, and that's what basically uh, paved the way for a relatively peaceful transition uh, of the Soviet regime in the late 1890s and, and early 1990s, late 80s and early 90s. Thank you, Arkady. That's a very judicious uh, um, riddle out of it, and, but I, I think it's very sensible indeed. Uh, Kolya, please bear in mind that I have run over terribly, so a very brief answer, if you will, particularly maybe on, the, on how we characterize a regime right now, because I'm sure we'll answer, we'll, we'll have to, we'll talk about, you know, what to do, um, uh, in future seminars. I'm already planning one in my I, head. I think, James, that all classifications are uh, very general, and if to find sure. features uh, the same for different regimes, you do lose the essence of these regimes. Like say, if to take Ekaterina's features, you can say yeah. that 10 years ago regime was absolutely the same, which is not true uh, in, in, in my view. So I would say that what we see now is very flexible and uh, is in flux in the sense that it's not solid regime, it's trying to transform itself. And I do hope that will not manage to uh, transform itself in a way it wants. So I would use uh, uh, Lilia Shevtsova's title, uh, Lost in Transition, but uh, in a different way, Lost in Transfiguration. Yeah, <laughs> nice finish. Thank you very much, Kolya. Ladies and gents, it's almost 10 past the hour. I'm very sorry for running this on, but it was a lot to get through. And in fact, my apologies to, to many of you for not managing to get everybody's question in. I'm sure Kolya and I will think up how to, how to redo this in a, in a different fashion soon. Um, I'm very sorry, Sebastian, uh, um, Bob, who, whose questions I didn't get in amongst, amongst others, Mikhail, uh, Mary's con um, contribution, which is on the chat, if you can see it, it's very important. Um, uh, I said at the start that the Russian Jewish program is, is back with a vengeance after the summer torpor. Um, we do have some uh, events coming up in the first half of September, not least uh, Ukraine's local elections on the 9th of September, something on the Belarus protests on the 11th of September. You're all invited to these. If you haven't had the invitation to the Ukraine's local elections one, then uh, we'll send it to you, let us know. I think the Belarus protests uh, event is about to, the invitation is about to go out. Um, I think Anna will also put it on the, on the chat line now or has done already. So with that, uh, yeah, I think I have promised myself and, and others that we must do a, a seminar soon on uh, whatever happened to the Russia report, which is a good a way of answering Tony's question as, as any in terms of you know what to do about Russia now. It seems a, a practical question that think tanks are obligated to answer. But with that, let me thank uh, profusely Yekaterina Shulman, Kolya Petrov on holiday, um, and uh, Arkady Ostrovsky with his uh, internet issues, uh, which you coped with manfully, Arkady. Thank you to all three of you. That was an illuminating and very important seminar, I feel, considering the context in which we're in, um, and there'll be many more of them, I'm sure. But thanks to all of you for, for joining. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.